why are you running for office <coughs> and uh, why should people vote for you and not your opponents? Right. So my name is Eric Hankey and I'm running for U.S. Congress in Texas's 31st Congressional District. Uh, the reason for my run, and we were speaking just before we got on camera about what I do for a living. I work for the Texas County and District Retirement System and I've spent the last five years of my life talking to thousands of people all over the state of Texas, hearing their concerns uh, specifically about health care and Social Security. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, I want to retire, uh, but I can't afford health care because I'm, you know, this, this woman that I met with a couple weeks ago uh, in Tom Green County in San Angelo, I'll call her Mary for the purpose of this discussion. She says, I'm 60 years old. I want to retire right now. My 92 year old mother uh, who has dementia is living with me. Um, and I don't have access to health care, and that's the only thing preventing me from being able to retire right now because I can't afford to write it an $800 a month check to get health coverage. And the other thing that I've heard over and over and over again, talking with all of these folks all over Texas, is they don't think Social Security is going to be there for them in retirement. And these are two kitchen table issues that I believe that we have the capacity to come together as a nation to solve. Um, at some point in time, we have to uh, be able to address these issues, and I think we need people to step up and solve these issues. And, and, and the realization that I've come to in talking to people all over Texas, and you may not hear a whole lot about this, we are more the same fundamentally than we are different. I think people are tired of partisan politics. I think people want candidates that are going to step up for them and advocate for them. And I think these are two kitchen table issues that we can get done and that need to get done because we will be facing a retirement crisis uh, if we don't fund Social Security. The people that I'm talking to stand to get a pension. Uh, most Americans will not have any kind of pension. It's whatever they were able to scrape together uh, in their 401ks when they were living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and then whatever Social Security is going to throw their way. And so I've, I've talked to thousands of people, and that inspired me to step up in, 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 in a different capacity or in addition to that. I'm really concerned with where our democracy is heading, and I decided to step up and run. So here I am. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Tammy Young, and I am running for Congress in our 31st Congressional District. There aren't a lot of people like me in Congress. And, uh, you know, I come from a working family. I lived in public housing as a child. I was a teenage mom and a high school dropout. And uh, I've experienced homelessness. I endured years of violent and abusive relationships before being able to break free from that to offer a better life for my children. After years of struggle, I did go back and get a GED. I worked my way through college, and I graduated with a degree in special education, owing more in student loan debt than I could ever possibly repay. So I know, like millions of Texans today, that working harder doesn't always result in doing better. And I know that it's so hard to get ahead when you're coming from behind. For the last three years, I have been honored to serve on the Round Rock City Council. And while I have watched our Congress become more and more divided and more and more gridlocked, here in Round Rock, or over there in Round Rock, you know, we work together, Democrats and Republicans alike, to solve problems that are really important to the people that we serve. We don't always agree. And when we don't agree, no one walks away angry. We just get back to work for the people we represent. And I'm really proud of what we've done in Round Rock. We've been able to be fiscally responsible and have one of the highest bond ratings in the state, while at the same time having one of the lowest tax rates for comparable cities of our size. We've done all of this while focusing on creating jobs, and workforce development opportunities through partnerships with the chamber and having passed a $15 minimum, out, minimum wage for our city employees and offering them great benefits. I'm also the only 
candidate in this primary who has already won an election. I know what it takes to campaign. Um, I won my council race. I avoided a runoff by 13 votes. I know what it took to do that. And so I am prepared to continue in this campaign to work just as hard as I did then as a full-time candidate. Uh, I'm proud of what we've done in Round Rock. If we can work together and build alliances, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, to get things done, I know that we can do that in Washington, D.C. And that's why I'm running for Congress. And that's why I hope folks will vote for me. I will start with you. What do you consider? most important piece of legislation that Congress could pass um, now or anytime soon? Gosh, the most important. There are so many issues, so many challenges in front of us right now, it's really difficult to, to narrow it down to just one thing. As I talk with voters across the district, you know, we all want the same things. What comes up over and over again, of course, is, um, is health care and having been a single mom working full time and not able to afford health care for my children i know firsthand how important it is that we make sure everyone has access to quality health care that they can afford you know we have got to drive those costs down immediately reducing the cost of prescription medication it should be our number one priority to to help with that the other thing is that people I'm talking with are really concerned about, which is this violent epidemic of gun violence. And as someone who has personally experienced gun violence, I have was held at gunpoint by an abusive boyfriend. And so I know firsthand how important it is that we keep guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them. And the Violence Against Women Act which closes the boyfriend loophole is incredibly important to me. So those are things that we can and do, can and should do right away. And I'll be focused on those things as, as well as so many others. <clears throat> so in addition to working for the retirement system, I've been a singer songwriter in the Austin, Texas central area, central Texas area for uh, over 20 years. And I was always hesitant. I, I, I made an album called Factory Man. It's just, this was long before I ever considered running for office. This was just the story of the place where my grandfather worked and uh, where he retired from. And they closed the factory down and they sent all the jobs uh, overseas. I want to see the middle class do well. And, and that's health care. And I think it's a living wage for people. Um, when I was a songwriter playing places like Green Hall, I didn't want to alienate people. I didn't want people to not like me because music is something that has the capacity to transcend a lot of the boundaries that otherwise divide us. But when I decided to run as a candidate and there was going to be a D behind my name, I'm out in the open, right? And so I might as well say exactly what it is that I want to say. And I wrote this song called Turn Texas Blue, where my campaign released a video about it. And in the, the, the second verse, I, I communicated what I thought was the, the most important part of our candidacy and what Democrats need to do. The lyric is, if you need to see a doctor but you can't afford the dues, if you work all day for minimum wage and you still can't make it through, and if you're tired of the terror that keeps shooting up our schools, if you want to see some changes made because thoughts and prayers won't do, turn Texas blue. So I would put, I would put health care first. Um, but we also have to make sure that our schools are safe and, and Americans also need to be able to put food on their table and the rising costs of housing is just getting astronomical uh, even where I live up in Williamson County and so I think people need a living wage. So I would say health care number one but obviously there's a lot that we need to address. So we'll start with you. Uh, both of you cited health care is number one. Um, talk to us about specifically how would you improve access to health care? What, what is your plan for improving that issue? Sure. And so I think we need to expand a public option. We need to expand Medicare and get coverage for people who can't afford to 
uh, pay out of pocket insurance premiums. Uh, in, in my mind, what we need to do right now is get people access to health care that don't have it and make sure that everyone gets covered. What covers the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time? And that's expanding that option so that everyone has coverage. Um, I know that our, there are some folks that are in other camps to where they are uh, Medicare for all. Um, I understand that. What I'm, I would not put myself in the camp of Medicare for all or nothing. Because then the message is to uh, those 20 million people that don't have access to health care is you guys need to hang on until we have time to put together a coalition uh, to make this thing happen. So we need access for people right now, and that's expanding the public option, expanding Medicare to allow people to get coverage. This is a, a personal issue for me as well as it is for, for so many people across the state. I've had to borrow money to fill a prescription for my kids. Uh, when my daughter was 16 years old, she needed to have her tonsils out. and I was working full time, did not have health insurance, and I certainly didn't have a bag of money for the hospital and the doctors that, that would require for her to get her tonsils out after about a year and a half of chronic infections. So. We have got to help people have access to affordable health care. Driving down out-of-pocket costs begins with reducing the cost of prescription drugs. We could do that quickly, a number of different things that we could do. We can first allow Medicaid, Medicare to uh, negotiate with the pharmaceuticals in the same way that the VA does. We can hold the pharmaceuticals accountable for the prices that they're charging for life-saving drugs. We uh, need to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, protect pre-existing conditions, and make sure that there is a public option so that everyone, whether or not they have access to a private health care through their employer, don't like it, can't afford it, don't have access, we need a public option so that everyone can be covered immediately at a price they can afford. What's a specific issue, and we'll start with you, uh, that you believe you can address by working across the aisle? I think we can address all issues by working across the aisle. Um, I've been doing that in Round Rock. I have a strong reputation as someone who works with Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, we've been able to have partnerships for workforce development and training opportunities, and I do think that making sure that everyone has a job, has an opportunity to have the skills that they need to have high wage jobs. That's an important thing that we can work across the aisle on. Uh, you know, people want to work hard and do better than just get by. But when we have 70% of Americans making less than $69,000 a year, that's really difficult to do. Um, we've got to address the fact that we need a shift from this perspective that everyone needs a four-year college degree and start investing in the many career opportunities that don't require four-year degrees. We build partnerships with universities and uh, community colleges and public high schools across the country so that our youth can come out of school, many of them, with the skills they need to go right into these high demand, high wage jobs. I think that we can do a lot to um, increase the quality of life for people across this country. At the end of the day, we all agree that, that this is the land of opportunity and the American dream just is too easily becomes a nightmare sometimes if you, if you get behind or you don't have the skills you need or the education you need. So we really can all work together. I, I know that we can to build quality jobs, high wage jobs for people across this country. I would say Social Security. Uh, working in retirement, this should be a no-brainer issue. This should be a no-brainer issue for our re Republican friends. Uh, this is a, a benefit that we have paid into most of us aside from the the few folks i know there's educators a lot of teachers and some folks that work in our um in, in various 
uh, like a lot of our appraisal districts, folks that I meet with don't pay in. But I think this should be something that we should be able to solve very easily. And, and we should be able to make a case to the American people. They, they want it. They know they need it. And they want to be able to retire with dignity without having to worry about, am I going to have to work into my 70s or 80s? Uh, I think Social Security, I would put that at the top of the list. <clears throat> my background, um, I come from a Republican family, and, and I understand Republicans, and I love to engage with them just because I love the exchange of ideas. I love to talk to people who see the world differently than I do. And, and I think that we can get sensible gun legislation written uh, to protect our schools, protect our churches. and I. And I think when you're not afraid to engage, and I think when your your campaign and your message is rooted in a values-based, let's do something to protect our schools and churches, we should be able to come to some sort of agreement to where we can reinstate the assault weapons ban, close the loopholes, and and and, and protect our schools, and and is that way our kids can get on the bus without having to worry about you know what's going to happen potentially at school today. So I, I would say those two things. And, 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 and it's, it's about having, as a, as a musician, what I've done for 20 years is connecting with people. You know, When I used to play down at Waterloo Ice House, I'd walk in there with my guitar and there's people having dinner. And you know they don't care about you. <laughs> it's like they don't want you to pull out the guitar because they're having dinner conversation. And over the course of that time, it's sitting down and making a connection with people and letting them know that, you care about them and that you're you're there to have an exchange there and that's something that as a musician and also as a public speaker uh, going into these places where I'm the outsider from Austin and I go to these rural places where there's these small you know little towns scattered all over our, our state and you go in there and they're kind of skeptical when I first walk in and then when they realize that I'm there to help them and also to understand them, that's that's not a, a skill I think that is uh, easily learned. That's something that's uh, you either have it or you don't. Your ability to be able to connect with with people. And I think ultimately being an effective legislator is about building alliances and coalitions, connecting with people, and trying to find some common ground. Talk a little bit about immigration and border security. Specifically, what do you support there, and uh, and do you support border wall? So, I am the son of an immigrant. My grandparents uh, and dad came over from Germany in the early fifties, and they didn't speak the language, and everything that they owned fit in a small wooden crate. And there's a piece of this crate currently hanging on the wall in my father's office in his home, which is, you know, we always remember where we came from and how we started. Um, the, the immigrant experience in America is, it's one that we need to keep alive. I think it's... The childhood separation that we engage with in this country, I think, is it's horrible. We need to make sure that our borders stay strong and protected. We don't need a wall. <laughs> I think we need to build bridges and not walls. And we have, uh, there's a facility in the eastern part of our county the Hutto Detention Facility where I've attended rallies there, uh, where there are women that are held there, um, seized by ICE. And they're just sort of held there indefinitely and it's a for-profit facility. And the corporation that operates that facility donates money to Mr. Carter's campaign. And so there's a direct conflict of interest. So while um, I think we need to keep the American dream alive and, and, and allow a path to citizenship, and we need to be cognizant that our friends um, from other countries are coming here seeking asylum and they are fleeing, 
other countries they're fleeing terrible situations I think about how terrible it must be for a mother to scrape together everything that she has and give that money to a stranger so that they can be brought to this country and that's a very powerful thing like how hard up would you have to be to give somebody else money to take your kid to another country so we can't forget that we have to be a nation of laws we have to protect our our borders but we can't lose our humanity and we have to realize that these institutions that are incarcerating people for money in this country we need to put a stop to that the separation of, of families at the border I I mean, that's just, that's heartbreaking to me as a mother and a grandmother. We need to permanently end that practice. And we have to, together, Democrats and Republicans, we have to tackle comprehensive immigration reform. It has to be a priority. It's also important that uh, we create a pathway, a reasonable pathway to citizenship for those who are here in this country, who are paying into the system and, uh, and not reaping any rewards. So there must be a clear path to citizenship. And we need to strengthen and streamline the process. So our asylum courts, we need to expand those. We need to have more immigration judges so that we can move through these processes more quickly and more fairly. As far as Border security, we have to have strong borders. It is important that we know who is coming into the country. It is important that we stop, um, that we stop people from coming in that shouldn't be coming in. In terms of the border wall, my concern there is, I mean, we already know that you know, portions of the wall have fallen over. We have video of people climbing portions of the new wall. Uh, and then we're diverting funds from the you know, military construction projects that directly impact the quality of life of our soldiers and their families for this border wall. So again, I support um, having secure borders, but I think that I would much rather see us explore more of the um, new technologies in a better way than building than the, the current wall that we're attempting to build. So. There's a lot we need to do. We need to work together to get it done. Hey, can you talk a little bit about your positions on gun control and uh, reforms in that area? And uh, what, I guess if you talk about what, you know, what's the right amount of regulation sure. versus while still protecting the Second Amendment? Sure. And I do support the Second Amendment, and I think it's completely possible that we uphold our Constitution and make our communities safe. Uh, we, we can do that. As someone who has stared down the barrel of a gun, I know what it's like to be in fear for my life. And sadly, I know now what it's like to fear for my grandchildren's lives, just because I know they're dropped off at school every day. So this is an important issue that we come together on and, um, and address. There is such strong bipartisan support for universal background checks. We, it is imperative that we keep guns, all guns, out of the hands of people who should not have them. Universal background checks is really important. Um, as a victim, I am really supportive of the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act and closing that boyfriend loophole. We need to have waiting periods that can't be circumvented at gun shows. These are all things that we can and should do, that we should be working across the aisle to get those things done. We need to do so much more uh, than what we're already doing. Uh, we need to close all the loopholes, we need red flag laws. 
there, there is a there is a fine line there between you know seeing something, saying something, and then you know imposing on someone else's uh, you know personal uh, you know, infringing upon someone else's rights to privacy, right? But I think there's closing those loopholes, the red flag laws, and um, and keeping our schools and churches safe is something that's just paramount to seeing uh, to helping this problem. Gun violence affects so many people in this country. And at some point in time, the NRA really has to take a really hard look at itself and say, okay, it's every American's right to protect themselves and to protect their homes. But what about protecting Americans and children and people in schools and people at concerts? Uh, I, 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 I'm not a hunter. I support people who, who um, you know, want a rifle, but I don't think that you need an assault weapon to hunt deer. If you need an assault weapon to hunt deer, you're not a very good shot. Okay. Uh, and it's disturbing um, at what we saw with the protesters. Uh, I was particularly disturbed and I posted it on social media on MLK Day when we were honoring a man who had been cut down um, by gun violence. And there were a bunch of people in Virginia that staged a protest on that day uh, to advocate uh, for firearms. And I just think that was not a mistake. It was intentional that they picked that day to do it. And so while I believe in, in, in everyone being able to protect themselves and their homes, uh, we also owe it to ourselves to curtail this issue. Um, one other thing I'd like to say about this, and I've talked to a lot of law enforcement in the field I think we need more gun education, and I think that this is something that gun owners should be able to get behind. When I talk to deputies at different sheriff's offices, they say the vast majority of weapons that find their way uh, into the wrong hands are stolen out of vehicles. So I would propose public safety announcements and education stating this issue, and that similar to the don't mess with Texas, that we need to lock up our guns. Question. Let me ask about uh, the impeachment going on. If you'd been in Congress this past fall, you would have um, faced a vote on that. Uh, would you have voted for the two articles that the House eventually passed? Um, do you have any criticisms about those uh, articles? Do you want more narrow, uh, more broad, etc.? I would have definitely voted um, to impeach the president, and and let me say that I'm also very I'm saddened by what we saw happen in the Senate because the message that we saw, the message that the Senate said to the American people is that facts, truth, and accountability uh, no longer pertains to the office of the president, and that everything was so terribly split amongst partisan lines, aside from a select few, very select few, unfortunately not enough people, I think that if the president truly had nothing to hide, then why not allow these witnesses come forth and testify? Because these are not people that were randomly chosen by the other party, these were people that worked in his administration, and the president owes it to the American people for the truth to come out. So I'm very saddened by what happened, uh, ultimately, and I support the impeachment of the president. I don't think that it's something that should have been taken lightly, and I don't think that it was taken lightly. But I was proud of what um, Sylvia Garcia uh, and her her management of uh, one as one of the impeachment managers of that process. I'm I'm proud that it, that her and people like Adam Schiff said, these are the facts, uh, this is what we need to discuss, 
and 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 we will impeach the president and we will send it over to the Senate and then we will let the process carry it out. I just think that the process ultimately failed the American people. It's such a, a disturbing time for our country and uh, I know only what I've read and heard on the news so I, I acknowledge that I don't have all of the information that our uh, men and women in Congress had. Based on what I've seen and read, I would likely have, yes, voted to impeach the president. I think it is important that our president and our all elected officials know that they're not above the law. Our elected officials need to set the standard. So uh, likely, yes. A pathway to citizenship. Do you have any concerns that it might unfairly advantage people who have broken our laws over people who haven't done that and also don't have the advantage of proximity, that people from countries who can't just come across a uh, land mass to get here? How do we square that? I do understand uh, that concern, and, and it is a legitimate concern. So there's going to have to be very careful deliberation and conversation on how we do this. But I think it's also important to acknowledge, you know, that we're so quick to, um, to want to punish folks who have come here illegally, even those who are here um, being productive members of our society, paying into Social Security, into systems that they, they will perhaps never get anything out of that benefit us, uh, but we don't hold employers accountable. The employers that, that make it possible for them to be here. Should, so, should the pathway exist only for people already here or ongoing so we tell people in other countries to come here even illegally, we'll have a process for you? Does it encourage that? Well, I think that it's important that we craft legislation that does not encourage that. So to me, there are two issues. There's the issue of what is already in place, and then there's the issue of moving forward. So uh, I think we have to address both issues, and there may be a different answer for each. And one of the things that I've learned as an elected official is that in order to solve a problem, you have to really dig in and understand the complexities of that problem. So it is important that we address all aspects of the issue. So to me, it doesn't have to be an either or. It doesn't have to be a zero sum game. So I think we need to look at them separately and make sure again that we do have strong borders. We don't want to encourage people uh, to continue to come. But I think it's also unfair to uh, the rhetoric that we have across the country that uh, assumes that everyone here illegally is here from Mexico, it just isn't true. We have people from Canada that overstay their visas um, for long periods of time. We don't read about that in the news. So there are people who are in this country illegally from places other than Mexico that come here on visas and then overstay their visas. So I think it's important to understand the whole picture instead of just what we hear in terms of this divisive rhetoric. If we choose to outline policy based on rhetoric, then we're not going to create lasting change. So, you know, there's validity to both arguments, and I think it's important that we find a solution that we can live with that solves the problem, not just today, but moving forward. Two years ago, um, MJ Hager ran a very strong race this district, um, she had the benefit of she had a you know, good story to tell, and she had a video that became quite well known, admired, and uh, she raised a lot of money. So if you have five people running, I guess my question would be, what recommends you, each of you, as someone who can be a rival, what she did, or improve upon it, in the serious race of this? Yeah, so MJ, uh, she's an awesome candidate. Uh, she ran an awesome race, and she came within three percentage points. She raised a lot of money. 
uh, and and I think she she caught Carter off guard. Um, we've got this primary that we're battling through. Um, I think there are, I think there are things to learn from her candidacy, um, and and I would, you know, as as the, uh, as the person, in this, uh, it, emerging from this primary, and presumably a runoff, uh, I would reach out to her directly and and ask her, what. If you could have done this over again, where would where would you have gone? That what I've heard is we need to get on the ground more in Bell County, and we need to get on the ground more in Williamson County. We need to knock on more doors. We need to engage more voters directly because it wasn't just about resources. She had plenty of money. It, it's it's about where where are we going to guide those resources? The other thing is, um, the National Party is very aware that this is one of the flippable congressional districts in Texas, and that Texas is in fact battleground. And we will have help this time around where we did not have help before, uh, where, that which where MJ did not have assistance. Uh, so we already have an infrastructure in place. Um, we, we know that there's going to be a lot more, there's, there's a, a lot more money out there from institutional donors who will invest in this race uh, once the nominee emerges. But what we're hearing a lot is, well, call us when you're the nominee, kind of thing. Uh, and you know, while while some people are engaging in a primary, a lot of the folks that truly have the capacity and want to see that change happen, they're holding back. So they're letting us fight it out. So here we are. Um, but the the demographics in Williamson County are shifting. I've lived in the district since '97. I've seen it change. I, there's tons of new neighborhoods popping up everywhere. We're, trying, we're still trying to figure out where are these people going to vote. But Williamson County went blue last time around. We have to narrow the margins in Bell. We have to find more people. We need to talk to veteran families on kitchen table issues. And we need to connect with them in a way to where we keep the coalition uh, that MJ built and we don't disenfranchise moderates and disenfranchise Republicans because there are a lot of Republicans that I talk to that feel like my party has left me behind. Uh, so we need to keep those people in place and we need to expand upon our base and we need to do those two things and if we do, if we're successful in doing those two things, we will flip 31. And I'm sorry, where do you, where do you live where? I live in Liberty Hill. Yes. MJ blazed a path. Uh, you know, she came in in a district that no one thought she had a chance in. And she came really, you know, from nowhere in terms of the district. She was not known in the district. She had never uh, run for office in the district before. And so she really put it on the map. And she was post primary able to raise a lot of money. And you know we've come into this race. I've come into this race in November, and we're you know we we feel good about our fundraising through the holidays, and we definitely are building momentum here um, in this quarter. So fundraising is going well for us now, and we have every reason to believe that post primary it will continue to go well for us. You know it's not certainly MJ is an incredible candidate. I wouldn't say I'm a better or worse candidate than MJ. I'm a different candidate, but I also intend to be an incredible candidate. So, uh, you know, I have a reputation having already won an election in the district, having already governed in Round Rock for three years, where I have a very strong relationship and a reputation as someone who works across the aisle, who works together as a practical, diligent person to get things done. Uh, I think that that's going to also go a long way to help with the resources that we need uh, to really to, to pick up that extra three points. Also, we have the benefit of hindsight. You know, we can go back and, and evaluate her race, which we have done and will continue to do, and know what's necessary. But I think uh, being able to maintain and build upon what she did, it's a pretty small margin to, uh, to a pretty small gap to fill, and I have no doubt that we'll have the resources we need to do that come November. You mentioned that you hear from people who say, my party left me behind. 
what specifically do they say? Specific issues, what are they, when they say that, what specific issues are they talking about? People want candidates that are going to go to Washington that are going to actually advocate for them, as opposed to taking special interest money and, and corporate donations and then just become part of that machine up there. There's a lot of folks that I talk to, they're just sick of partisan politics. They're like, when you go to Washington, what are you going to do? Like, are you still going to care about us? Or are you just going to go up there and better yourself? Why are you stepping up to run? Are you stepping up to run to serve? Or are you stepping up to run to serve yourself? And I think we've got a lot of folks that have seen time and time and time again where their government, you know, if, if it's not put together of everyday people, then they're not going to pass policy for everyday people, right? And that's, that's the deal. And so when I hang out at a, at a farmer's market in Georgetown, and I'm down there talking to voters and getting signatures and just shaking hands and engaging with people. I don't lead with, hey, I'm Eric Hankey and I'm a Democrat who's running for Congress. I just introduce him and, and just say, I'm, I'm running for office. Tell me about you. And, and, you know, I talk to this guy and he's got his camouflage hat on. And it's like, I, you know, I totally get that he's a conservative. And we just start talking about issues. And it's like, yeah, I just, I just want somebody who's going to do the work that we need doing so that legislation can pass to benefit everyday people. And, and, and there's a lot of people out there that are, that are apolitical, don't really, they don't have the time when, when they, they put the, their, their kids to school in the morning and then they go to work and then they come home and then, you know, and just getting the kids fed and then in bed. There's not a lot of time for the average American to, to digest all that's out there, especially in this news cycle, to find out, one, what's going on, and then two, should I care about it, um, and then three, how does this impact me? So I just think there's a lot of folks that are feeling disenfranchised, and I think we have the capacity to be able to connect with those voters and say, yeah, I'm going to have a D behind my name, but you know what? I'm going to serve everybody in Congress. I'm not just going to serve the Democrats. I'm not just going to cater to them because our district is purple. And there's a lot of good, just hardworking families in that district that, you know, we haven't had representation on the ground. We haven't had town halls until MJ brought this thing within three points. And now Carter's showing up and he's saying, all right, I'm going to have a town hall for you guys, but it's invite only. And it's going to be on a Tuesday afternoon at noon when you're at work and, and can't make it. And that's what we need on the ground is someone who's actually going to step up and serve and be present. Did you want to address that? Or? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, I agree that there are a lot of uh, a lot of folks that feel disenfranchised in the district and they want to know that their representative is going to fight hard every day for them and never give up. For the last couple of years, I've gone to DC with the Austin Chamber um, on the advocacy trip and you know where we advocate for the, our needs here in Central Texas with our Texas delegates. And our congressman has stood in front of a room of local leaders and told us not to count on them to get anything done until we elect different people for them to work with because they can't get along. This is exactly what people are tired of. And when we have people in Congress, like Congressman Carter, who have apparently given up, who are too tired to, uh, to maybe keep working through the difficulties, it's time for change. And I think that that is something that the people in our district are aware of. And we do have independents and moderate thinkers on both sides of the aisle that are absolutely looking for fresh ideas. They're looking for someone who these issues are personal to because I've lived it. And people want to know that their representative is fighting for the things that matter to them because it matters to their representative. So I agree that there are a great number of independents and moderates within the district um, that are feeling like they don't have representation. And so we, we absolutely will appeal to them. Eric, I want to circle back on something. You talked about people go up there, they wind up representing special interests. A few minutes before that, you talked about 
appealing to and being told to wait to institutional donors was a phrase you used. Mm -hmm. Don't institutional donors tend to have special interests? Well, the institutional donors have special interests for sure, but we're also not going <clears throat> just to represent them. And I've made the pledge that <clears throat> that I would um, would get corporate money out of politics, that I would support ending Citizens United, <clears throat> that I wouldn't be taking any corporate PAC money. Um, would we take money from an interest group that aligned with our ideals? Yes. Um, we we are we are but trying. But you know. That's what a Republican might say, what you call special interest money. They're saying, no, it's just money that aligns with their ideals. What's wrong with it? So uh, the, the unfortunate reality when you decide to step up and run for office, you have to be able to raise funds. And the people that I'm calling, the people that are donating to my campaign, they're musicians and they're teachers uh, and, and coworkers and people that I go to church with. There's nothing wrong with taking a donation from an individual that says, I believe in your campaign and what you're doing. But I think that's a big difference from taking corporate PAC money that says, okay, when the phone rings, you're gonna prioritize our call over uh, the other people. When somebody writes me a check for $2,800, I appreciate that donation, but I don't value that person any more than the other person who says, I'm a musician. Here's ten bucks. It's all I got. So, you know, we have to be able to raise money, and we are we are by taking that non corporate pledge, we're we're saying okay, we have values that we're going to hold to, and we're not going to take that money, but we have to find it from somewhere. So, you know, if someone who gives a lot of money to Democrats says, okay, I want to donate to your campaign, well, we're going to take that money. We need it, right? Um, but we don't value that donor uh, any more as a constituent than a person who says, this is all I have. This is, you know, five or ten bucks, but it's my last five or ten bucks. And, and ultimately, you have, to, you have to take care of everybody when you go to Congress. Well, you'll count, I guess, whoever gets the nomination on support from the DCCC, and a lot of their money comes from big donors with special interests. Yeah, so we can... We can try to go to, and I appreciate your question. Um, at, at what point in time do you draw a distinction between uh, we're going to be completely pure? You know, like it's like I I want to I want to curb greenhouse gas emissions, but if somebody who uh, you know is from Houston uh, and, and and works in oil and gas decides to donate to my campaign, do you turn that person down? I mean, but I think there's a there's a big distinction between taking that money versus taking a donation from Exxon, you know, we, we have the, the, the interest that we're fighting against here uh, and Mr. Carter is someone who is bought and paid for by defense contractors, for-profit prisons, and so we're trying to, to scrape together every bit of coalition that we can to overturn that. Uh, so I definitely see the point that you're making. I think if I drew the line and said, okay, I'm not going to take money from any sort of institution whatsoever, then you're you're painting yourself into an even further corner, uh, where you know we're the underdogs here. And so there's I think there's a line, there, there's a, a line to draw somewhere where you say this is not in line with our values and we're not going to take this money. And then you know if someone wants to donate to our campaign, well yeah, we need all the help we can get. But they're also buying into our values. Um, they're buying into what it is that we're trying to ultimately accomplish. So, you know, let, let's just go to public funding of elections, and that way I don't have to spend all my time on the phone and talking to people for money, and I can actually be out talking to voters and what they care about. I'd be up for that. Let's do that. Because they said, you know, three or four million dollars to win this election. Well, if I had three or four million dollars, just think of all the things I can do in my community. How would you do public funding? Everybody who files gets the same amount of money, regardless of how real candidate they might be? Well, I mean, we'd have to look at some uh, some options on the table, but I think if, if, if every American had X amount of dollars that they can allocate to a campaign, then you could go out and, 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 and put, you know, caps on, okay, you can only donate X amount of dollars, so, you know, whether you're exceedingly wealthy or you're, you know, just getting by middle class, then that will cut out a lot of those special, special interests. 
So, I mean, there's things that we can do to reform our processes, but we first have to get people elected who are willing to take those kinds of measures. Uh, and, and that's going to be one seat at a time, just a surgical replacement of, you know, people that have been doing it that way for so long, they've just got a system in place to keep them there. Have either of you decided who's getting your vote in the Democratic presidential primary or U.S. Senate primary? This is a tough one. Uh, the top of this ballot is going to drastically shape everything down the ballot, and, and we know that. We are acutely aware of that. The Democratic Party, in it, it has a, I wouldn't say, a, well, I don't know if you call it a wide spectrum, but there is a spectrum there. There, there are different philosophical approaches. We need to defeat Trump, period, end of story. I've seen different arguments in terms of who can do that. Um, I, I would say I'm a left of center person, but, but I'm not all the way <laughs> to the left. Uh, that's just where I am personally, and I think that that is where that is where my district is. And so if a, if a candidate, if we had a candidate that could, that wouldn't alienate those people that I mentioned before that are feeling disenfranchised and like sick of all this partisan bickering, I would probably be much happier. Uh, so that is a very diplomatic response to your question. Take a vote here. Sound like an undecided, didn't it? Hands, please. Yes. <laughs> How about you? Have you decided in the president or Senate race? I have not decided in the presidential primary. I will, I will tell you what I'm looking for. Um, my vote will go to the person that I think has the, uh, the policy ideas and the temperament to bring this country together. I'm looking for someone who, who is willing to uh, to stand apart from the divisiveness, from the polarizing rhetoric. I'm looking for leadership that can uh, move us through a really difficult time in our country. Would either of you be happy if Warren or Sanders was a nominee, or are they either one of those too far in some direction for you? If they're our nominee, then, then I will get behind them and I will do everything I can to make sure that they're successful. Very difficult. <laughs> I get it. And are either one of those too far left for you? You know, for our district, I think that that in this district, it's going to be um, more likely to have someone with more center yeah. views. I just, I would just like to see somebody be able to bring us together because, you know, we're. I wasn't around during Vietnam. I have friends that were and friends that serve and. You know, I, and I love history, studied history extensively, went, went to school at Southwestern University. I've always loved history. And I think we are as divided now as a country, uh, maybe as, as any time back to the Civil War. I mean, some people will say, you know, Vietnam was a pretty divisive area, er, era. There was a lot going on, political assassinations, and very unpopular war, civil rights. Um, at some point in time, we, we have to find somebody who can bring this thing back down because we just can't, we can't keep going on this way. And, and, and somebody used an, an analogy of you know, a pendulum as it, as it swings, it pushes people further out to this extreme and then when it swings back this way, it pushes people back out to that extreme. I think the average American is just right here saying, what's going on? Like this is just, this has gotten out of hand and it's, it's impacted both parties. It's impacted candidates. Uh, it's, it's impacting our primaries uh, to where like there are these litmus tests that happen and like you're not enough this way or you're not enough this way. At the end of the day, we have to be able to govern and we have, we have to show that government can still get things done without shutting down. 
By the way, don't talk about average Americans. We're exceptional, not average. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, you're right. We're coming up to the end of our time. Uh, is there anything that we didn't ask or touch on that you wanted to make a point of addressing? Or got just a few minutes. I guess I would just like to say um, that you don't have to guess how I will govern because I've already been doing it. You don't have to guess whether or not I can work with absolutely anybody and everybody that I need to work with to get things done for the people I represent <coughs> because I've already proven that I can do that and I've been doing that. And so um, I would just be so honored to, to have your support. Thank you for having us today. I would say I, we need candidates. I, I, think, and I think the American people want candidates who are not career politicians. They want something different. And they want someone who is going to inspire them. They want someone that they can trust. And they want someone that they can send to Washington with the faith in that person, knowing that they won't get up there and sell them out. And I think that we have the capacity through music uh, to communicate with voters in a way that no one else can. And, and I think music has a way of transcending the boundaries that otherwise divide us. And I believe with all my heart that artists and musicians can change the world because my heroes, Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson and people like Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie all use their music in a way to communicate to affect social change. And that's what our campaign's about and that's what we're doing because I'm meeting people all the time and they say, you know what, I met a guy in church yesterday who said, you know what, I've never voted for a Democrat before ever, but I'm gonna vote for you. And I said, I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. <laughs>